Chapter 20. Political Algodicy. Cynical Cosmologies and the Logic of Pain. Quoting Oswald Spengler, Urfragen, Munich, 1965. What is all this racket from constructions, ships, mines, battles and books seen from outer space? In comparison with the Earth's crust, nothing. Even if the hard Nazi sports subjects proclaimed their sympathies with prosthetic life under the mask of vitalism, and in this way sought to counter pain through denial, in the end they too could not evade the question of the meaning of pain. Like nothing else, pain, which can announce death, challenges metaphysical meaning. The latter wants to know what the immeasurable suffering of the century means, who is responsible for it, and to what whole it could contribute. Everyday understanding, made safe through routine from thoughts that are too deep, does not let itself get caught in such discussions. It thus remains protected from explicit cynicism. Mostly it does not say anything more than, that's life. Those who take on the question and risk having an opinion about suffering are drawn into a region where one has to be very sure of one's metaphysical views or else become cynical. Algodicy means a metaphysical interpretation of pain that gives it meaning. In modernity, it takes the place of theodicy as its converse. In the latter, it was asked, how are evil, pain, suffering and injustice to be reconciled with the existence of God? Now the question is, if there is no God and no higher meaning, how can we still bear the pain? The function of politics as substitute theology immediately becomes clear. The nationalists, as a rule, did not hesitate for a moment to claim that the immeasurable suffering of the war had been meaningful as sacrifice for the fatherland. The momentum of such claims was hindered solely by the fact that the lost war and the victor's dictatorship in peacetime, as well as the disappointed revolution, put this nationalist offer of meaning into question. One might consider whether the much-quoted legend of the dagger thrust was a desperate rescue attempt for the political algodicy of the right. For to realise that Germany would lose the war could be expected from even the densest nationalist. But to admit that, quote, everything had been for nothing, end quote, and that the untold torments had no political meaning at all, for many contemporaries that was unbearable. The legend of the dagger thrust was no naive myth, but a willed self-delusion of the right. Their effort was also witnessed by Hitler's bitter fortune. Those who ask for the meaning of the suffering in the First World War were drawn by the question into a region where politics, natural philosophy and medical cynicism met. Scarcely any speaker in those years refrained from medical metaphors. Sickness, cancerous growths, operations, healing through crisis. In Mein Kampf, Hitler spoke of the violent catastrophe that was to be preferred to a creeping political tuberculosis. The medical metaphors of the right were intended to eliminate the sickness as well as the enemy within with quote-unquote steel and radiation. The left at least registered the double danger of the sickness. Quoting Erich Musum, Wahrhaftigkeit in Fanal 2, 1928. If, however, the revolutionary proletariat wants to be the doctor who has to take on the operation that is recognised as being unavoidable, then it is not allowed to continually soil its hands in the open, festering sores of the sickness. For then, During the operation, the surgeon himself would carry the poisonous substances into the body of the patient again, so vitiating his task of ridding the patient of them. The well-meaning, cool gaze of the natural philosopher is superior to that of the doctor, for the former orders human distress into a cosmic, functional relation. Before the gaze of the biologist, and all the more before that of the astronomer, The minuscule convulsions of humanity melt into insignificance, as if they were only ornaments in the vast game of waxing and waning. Rudolf G. Binding, in his poems Stolz und Treue, 
Pride and Sadness, 1922, tried to appropriate such a biological grand view for himself. Heroes fall, and sons leave their mothers. They are all simple laws. The breathing and batting of an eyelid in a colossal happening. Wailing. Here too is the quintessence of heroic hardening. Ascent. Pride. A solid block ego that becomes a heroic, sensible machine for itself. Nazi schoolbooks treasured it. Readers note the word ascent in that sentence is the variety ascent as in agreeing to a thing, not ascent as in going up a thing. The political algodices proceed according to an elementary schema, withdrawal from feelings of empathy into a pure observational coldness. In this exercise, Ernst Junger became a complete virtuoso. He is one of the tightrope walkers between fascism and a stoic humanism who eludes simple labelling. Nevertheless, Junger is unmistakably one of the master thinkers of modern cynicism, in whom cold posturing and sensitive perception are not mutually exclusive. Ideologically, he practices an <clears throat> ideologically he practices an aestheticizing political biology, a subtly functionalist termite philosophy. He too can be reckoned among the enthusiasts of the hard subject who can stand the storm of steel. His coldness is the price of staying awake in the middle of the horror. It qualifies him as a precise witness of what has happened in our century by way of modernizing horror. To bury Junger under an all-too-crude suspicion of fascism would thus be an unproductive attitude towards his work. If there exists an author in our century who fits Benjamin's formula of a secret agent, Junger must be it. Like scarcely any other, he took up a listening post in the middle of fascist structures of thinking and feeling. His contemplative hardness combines with a pronounced readiness to speak out as witness of his own experiences. If, on the one hand, Junger confesses to pre-fascist tendencies, then, with his quote-unquote hunger for experience, he reveals a quality that no other fascist possessed. In general, this quality represents a spirit of mature openness to the world and liberality, with which today a new left would identify itself. Quoting... Ernst Junger, a steel eroticist, 1930, De Kampf als inneres Erlebnis, Struggle, Struggle as Inner Experience, 1933, pages 33 to 34. The longer the war lasted, the more sharply did it shape sexual love into its form. The spirit of the battle of material produced men the world had never seen before. Steel natures put into action and battle in its most horrible form. There, a ready femininity paraded in long rows, the lotus blossoms of asphalt, Brussels. There, only steel-like character could stand without being worn down in the turmoil. These bodies that turned to love were pure function. In the prose sketches of Das Abenteuerliche Herz, Abenteuerliche the adventurous heart, there is a passage that clarifies Junger's biological algodicy. From Abenteuer Lechers Herz, second version, pages 61 to 62. From the beach plays, Zwei Zinovitz. In the dense brush between the behind the dunes, in the middle of a swathe of reed, I captured a happy picture on my usual walk the large leaf of a trembling poplar into which a circular hole had been broken. From the edge of the hole, a dark green fringe seemed to hang down that, on closer observation, revealed itself to be a row of tiny caterpillars eagerly sucking the leaf juice with their mandibles. A short time ago, a deposit of butterflies' eggs must have hatched there. The young brood had expanded like a bushfire on its nourishing soil. The peculiarity of this sight consisted in the painlessness of the destruction it mirrored. Thus the fringe gave the impression of hanging threads of the leaf itself, 
which seemed to have lost none of its substance. Here it was so open to view how the double bookkeeping of life balances out. I had to think of the solace Conde gave to Mazarin, who was weeping over the 6,000 dead at the Battle of Freiburg. Bah! In a single night in Paris more people give their lives than this action cost. This attitude of the battle leader, which sees the change behind the burning, has long struck me as the sign of a higher healthiness about life that does not shrink back from the bloody incision. Thus I experience pleasure when I think of the phrase consumption forte, forte? strong consumption, which so angered Chateaubriand and which Napoleon occasionally used to murmur in those moments of the battle when the general was inactive, in which all reserves are on the march, while the front, under attack from mounted squadrons and the fire of artillery that has been moved up, melts as if under a tempest of steel and fire. They are words one does not want to be without, snippets of inner monologues at the melting ovens that glow and vibrate, while in smouldering blood the spirit distills into the essence of a new century. This language is founded on trust in life that knows no empty spaces. The sight of its fullness causes us to forget the secret sign of pain that separates the two sides of the equation. Just as here, the gnawing labour of the mandibles separates caterpillar and leaf. Junger's general's perspective also resembles that of a biologist. For this reason, something of the recognition of the great pulsing of life between procreation and death creeps into his political sentiments. However, he ignores the threshold that separates natural death from a political death by violence. He thus transfers biological observations to the great warring organisms that strike out at one another in struggles of hegemony and survival. With full consciousness, Jung blurs the boundaries between zoology and sociology. The war is in fact a phenomenon of the, quoting Hegel, spiritual animal realm. Jung thus provokes us as a political entomologist. His psychological sleight of hand consists in simultaneously assuming the standpoint of the insect and the scientist. He thinks himself not only into the devouring caterpillar, but also into the devoured leaf. He goes with his sense organs to the front, which melts into fire. With the cold organs of thinking, however, he stands at the same time on the general's hill, from which vantage point the battle offers itself as an aesthetic drama. This double ego corresponds to that of a political schizophrenic. Quote, fear eats up souls, end quote. The horrors of the war have eaten away his soul, the shell saves itself on a cold star from where his dead ego observes its own survival. Gazing at the stars was a typical form of Weimar algodicy. Its main author, almost forgotten today, is the astronomer Bruno H. Borgel, who's very popular in his own time. Weimar Celestial Authority number 1 a Sunday philosopher who, with humorously melancholy observations on humanity in the universe, had gathered a congregation of hundreds of thousands of readers about him. In the political realm, he was the author of Class Conciliation, of Compromise Between Labours and Entrepreneur, of Compromise Between Labour and Entrepreneurs. For decades, he practised his astronomy as a kind of pastoral care for the confused petty bourgeoisie. His Celestial Science, which was even reprinted recently, sold a fantastic number of copies. His autobiography, too, From Arbeiter zum Astronomen, from Worker to Astronomer, 1919, had sold 100,000 copies by the beginning of the 30s. In one part of his Du and das Weltall, Ein Weltbild von Bruno H. Bruegel, you and the Universe, a world picture by Bruno H. Bugel, 1930, we find the natural philosophical confession of the author under the heading, The Great Law. In the soul-destroying or elevating spaciousness, according to your taste, of astronomical ways of thinking, the political moral cramps of Weimar micropolitics loosen up. The inner desert, however, grows relentlessly. 
does Boyle not further, in a humorous, chatty tone, the subject's self-freezing? What Boyle speaks of as the great law is the wave phenomenon he attempts to follow from electrical and acoustic vibrations into the transformation of human cultures. Quoting pages 48 to 51, and also page 53. Unrelentingly wave and crest and wave trough follow each other. Now above, now descending to the trough, striving to ascend again, again in the trough, and finally, noiselessly, petering out and in the sand. The leaf falls, its time has come, its definition has reached its end, it sinks to the great layer of hummus from which new life will arise. All goings-on vibrate in waves everywhere. In a thousand forces it swings up and down. Sound waves carry over from the bell tower of the small maritime chapel. Light waves whiz in a flight as quick as thought from faraway stars down to the small globe earth. Electrical waves surge around me, making their way from high masts over land and sea, broadcasting human wit and human stupidity as far as the furthest outposts of civilization. Waves full of mysterious wonder surge around us. They bring the great law into being in the small ego. W. Fleece's tireless research uncovered the marvellous law that these two different life substances, these female and male cells, have differing lifespans. That the male substance is characterised by a 23-day period, the female substance by a 28-day period. This pulsation of changing life energies can be clearly felt within us. And out of days comes the year, that too a mighty wave in earthly happenings. But day and year peter out, tiny ripples on the sea of eternity. Cultures that leave their mark on the globe for centuries are also trains of waves in humanity. Thousands of years ago, the old culture of the Chinese came and went, that of the Indians, that of the Egyptians. Many waves of cultures saw old Mother Earth come roaring over them. They came and went like summer and winter. It seems as if the culture of our age, the culture of Europe, is beginning to decline. In square brackets, there follows a footnote that refers to Oswald Spengler's significant work. Close square brackets. Bergel emphasises that even the quote-unquote eternal stars do not represent any exception to the law of waxing and waning. Our sun too will be extinguished, quoting page 65, so that on this tiny star, Earth, everything will sink into night and ice, into the silence of eternal death. In the melancholy spaciousness of astronomical observations, a deep layer of Weimar life feeling is mirrored. The subjects collaborate instinctively with that which annihilates them and makes them significant. Yeah, I apologise, makes them insignificant. They train themselves in inhuman perspectives. They flee into the cold and vastness. Their affirmations are directed toward everything that is not themselves, toward everything that helps this iced over ego to forget itself in the great whole. Who offers resistance to this training and self-forgetting? Did the Weimar left understand how to stem the impulse of cynical cosmology and political biology? Even today the historian stands perplexed before the perplexity of leftist slogans of that time. The left too strove as well as it could to become a quote-unquote solid block. Here too the quote-unquote line, quote-unquote character, the quote-unquote will of iron dominated. Walter Benjamin was one of the few who systematically sought contact with the experiences, materials and ways of thinking and reacting of the other side. Like scarcely any other, he mastered the art of rethinking, the rescue of experience from the monopoly of reactionary twaddle. The masterpiece of such rethinking is to be found at the end of his book, Einbahnstrasse, that would be One Way Street, 1928, where he ventured into the lion's den in order to speak of things that otherwise were appropriated by the military right, about war experiences and the blood wedding of human technology and the cosmos. With a small twist, he succeeds in uncovering the spiritlessness of bourgeois philosophy of technology. Mastery of nature is not the significance of technology, but rather the clever mastery of the relation 
between humankind and nature. Quoting pages 123 to 126 on the planetarium. If, as Hillel once had to do with the Jewish doctrine, one had to express the doctrine of antiquity very briefly, standing on one leg, the sentence would have to read, quote, the earth will belong to them alone who live from the forces of the cosmos, end quote. Nothing distinguishes the human being of antiquity from the human being of modernity more than the former's surrender to a cosmic experience. The latter hardly knows. Its disappearance can already be noticed in the blossoming of astronomy at the beginning of modern times. Antiquity's way of dealing with the cosmos was affected differently, in ecstasy. Ecstasy is indeed the only experience in which we reassure ourselves about what is nearest to us and what is furthest from us, and never the one without the other. That means, however, that the human being can communicate ecstatically with the cosmos only in a community. It is the threatening error of modernity to regard this experience as irrelevant or avoidable and to leave it to the individual as revelry on beautiful starry nights. No, it becomes due over and over again, and then peoples and lineages elude it just a little as in the last war, when it made itself felt in the most fearful way as an attempt at a new, unheard-of wedding with the cosmic powers. Masses of people, gases, electrical forces were set free. High-frequency currents traversed the countryside. New stars lit up in the sky. Airspace and the depths of the sea hummed with propellers. And everywhere, sacrificial shafts were bored into Mother Earth. This great wooing of the cosmos took place for the first time on a planetary scale namely in the spirit of technology. However, because the greed for profit of the ruling class thought of atoning for its will to profit with it, technology betrayed humanity and transformed the bridal setting into a sea of blood. Domination of nature, so the imperialists teach, is the meaning of all technology. But who would want to trust a disciplinary master who explained that the meaning of education is the domination of children by adults? The thrill of genuine cosmic experience is not bound to that tiny fragment of nature that we are used to calling nature. In the nights of annihilation during the last war, a feeling shook the frame of humanity that resembled the fortune of epileptics, and the revolts that followed this feeling were the first attempt to bring the new body under its control. The power of the proletariat is the measure of its becoming healthy. If its discipline does not grab this body to the marrow, no pacifist reasoning will be able to save it. What is living will only overcome the tumult of annihilation in the ecstasy of creation. Benjamin succeeds in doing something no mere analyst of struggle, strategist or ideologue of hardness could do. In the course of his meditation, a piece works itself loose from the hardening cramp of the subject. Ecstasy. The dissolution of the ego is recognised as the precondition for cosmic communication. At the same time, it provides a presentiment of the reconciliation of human beings with one another. The ambiguity of the topic does not let go of Benjamin either. He speaks of proletarian discipline that has to grab the social body to the marrow. The entire contradiction lies there openly in a nutshell. From the ecstasy of creation to strict discipline, there is no easy path. Fascism had brought ecstasy and discipline together insofar as it mobilised the tumult of power and ecstasies of destruction in its columns. It organised not only the interests of big capital, but also a piece of political mysticism. Benjamin's thought play tries to rival the fascist threat by pointing out to the left the necessity of tearing the ideological weapons and the psychological principle of fascism out of its hands. Among the few philosophers of the time who did not seek the individual's salvation in hardenings, coolings and solidifications, Max Scheller assumes a special place. He too was a great ambiguist, a double agent, and subversive citizen who took joy in confessing. The war had twisted his head too, and moved him to horrifying exercises in thinking that affirmed war and Teutonic tumult, De genius de Krieges and de Deutsches Krieg. The Genius of War and the German War, Leipzig, 1915. 
Later, as one of the few, he expressly moved away from such, quote, armed service with the pen, end quote, as Thomas Mann said once about his own case. By 1921, in his protest against the German plague spirit of, quote unquote, fulfillment of duty at any cost, he had long ceased to use martial language, quote, on the betrayal of joy, end quote. There he provides psychological and moral arguments for an annihilating critique of the Nazi doctrine of felicity well in advance of what came later. That is, that lying philosophy of strength through joy with which the populist labour surface, Arbeitsdienst, secured domination over unhappy dispositions. The Nazis knew how to mobilise the hunger for something positive that drives unhappy and disoriented individuals to become, quote-unquote, involved and to join ranks to work together at a, quote-unquote, reconstruction. Scheller sees that all this can lead nowhere. When unhappy people reconstruct and get involved, they only spread their unhappiness. Quoting Scheller, Lieber und Erkenntnis, 2nd edition, 1970, page 72, Only happy people are good, Marie Ebner Eschenbach once said rightly. As has been shown, a peculiarly ironic or cynically hard affirmation of evils as valid and ineluctable realities is part of the Weimar zeitgeist. In the yes, a defensive tendency easily comes to the fore, an armouring of the ego against its suffering, a no to what would be subjective truth, no to inner wounds, to weakness and neediness. One begins to see this more clearly when one employs Scheller's important algodicy writing of 1916, from Sinn des Leidens, on the moment of suffering, for the purpose of contrast. In this text, Scheller collects elements of another ethics and politics, not hardening against suffering, but extension of the yes and of recognition even to our pain. This, however, according to Scheller, is possible only in a religiously grounded life that, in its deepest spiritual layers, feels itself as something indestructibly secure in being. Capital B, being. Scheller refers to this as blissfulness. Zeligkeit. The secret of such an ability to suffer thus lies not in the hardening of the ego, not in political algodices of the solid block, strength through joy, iron front, shoulder-to-shoulder, steel ego, reconstruction ego type, but in the buried and forgotten Christian principle that Tolstoy revived, do not resist evil. Quoting pages 64 to 65. An enormous relaxation of tension that in itself had to have the effect of a redemption. A relaxation through straightforward recognition through the naive expression of pain and suffering. No longer any ancient, arrogant suffering that glories in suffering because its magnitude measures one's own power, but also no pride in hiding it from oneself or others under the appearance of equanimity or under the rhetorics of suffering and dying wise men. The scream of the suffering creature that was restrained for so long reverberates again freely and harshly through the universe. The deepest suffering the feeling of being cut off from God is expressed freely by Jesus on the cross. Why have you forsaken me? And no more reconstruction whatsoever. Pain is pain. Evil is evil. Pleasure is pleasure. And positive blissfulness, not merely peace or Buddha's redemption of the heart, is the good of all goods. Also no blunting, but a soul assuaging, suffering through of the suffering and sympathy for oneself and for others. Every polemical subjectivity arises in the final analysis from the struggles of denial of egos against pain, which they inevitably encounter as living beings. They carry on reconstruction, armament, wall building, fencing in, demarcation and self-hardening in order to protect themselves. However, within them, the fermentation goes on unceasingly. Those who build up and arm will one day build down and let loose.